<laughs> Hi, from the van build. It's the Saturday morning virtual caravan class. Welcome everyone. Glad you could be here with us. My name is Robert Wright. I'm the caravans coordinator for HAWA. Our class format is very simple. We do a 30 minute presentation followed by 30 minutes of question and answers. At 25 minutes after the hour, we will turn on the chat feature. So that should allow you to ask your questions in the chat. Make sure you make it, it's on attendees and participants, and we'll be able to see your questions and get your answers. We have a great program for you today. We're gonna to be talking about the HAWA membership top, or not membership. It's weird. Mentoring. Mentoring topics, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> The HAWA mentoring topics and our speaker today is Phyllis Bickford. Phyllis has been a full-time nomad for about three years. Uh, she lives in a Chevy cargo van. She built it out herself. In the early days of HAWA, she put out an announcement for an assistant, Sue Ann. And as Phyllis says, she applied and that changed everything. She has been an assistant to Sue Ann Carlson since September of 2018. And it has taken on her adventures she has never dreamed of. She has had the opportunity to be part of the minivan award events like the one we're doing now and help develop a list of topics used to mentor for the new minivan recipients. Everyone, please welcome Phyllis as she talks about the HAWA mentoring topics. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Hey, Rob, Rob, Rob. <laughs> All right. That's why we're live. <laughs> Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody here this morning, an actual live audience. Very, very cool. Um, I would like to also especially welcome the new recipients and the mentors that are willing to be here for the next two weeks uh, and giving of your knowledge and your time and your caring and all that it takes to um, be the recipient's next new best friend. <laughs> Anyway, um, I would, uh, <clears throat> today what we're going to be doing is going over the learning topics used during the two weeks that stay when the new recipients come to pick up their home on wheels. Uh, these, are, these recipients uh, are, um, as part of the, they're part of the many, oh, well, I'm stumbling really badly today. I think I'm a little nervous and I'm trying to follow a script I wrote which always makes it a little bit more awkward. So I'm going to try and speak more from my, my mind instead of my script. We're here today because we have two new recipients that have been selected to receive minivans from the HAWA Minivan Award Program. And as part of that, they will be going um, through, staying camping here with everybody for two weeks and gaining the personal knowledge of the mentors. And they've been selected because they've got experience on the road that they can share because of their, their personal um, personality, their ability to relate to people and, um, and, their, and, and their availability too, <laughs> because for nomads to be able to give up two weeks and commit to be here is a big deal and we totally appreciate you being here. So um, as an assistant to Homes, to Sue Ann Carlson, who's the direct executive director for Homes on Wheels Alliance, um, I have been able to be part of these minivan builds since the beginning and they've evolved as time's gone, time has gone by. We've learned a lot. Every single time we do, we learn so much and I'm sure we're gonna be a lot smarter after the two weeks we finish here. But one of the things we learned is that we really need to focus on the, the recipients and not so much on the build. It's about the recipients and making sure they have the tools they need to be successful. The minivan, the way it's outfitted, and then their skills and, and the connection to the community. So the minivan award program, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's um, a program that is, has been developed by Homes on Wheels Alliance. And the uh, HAWA goes out and purchases minivans that will become part of the program and donated to recipients. The, the funding for that comes from sponsors and it comes from generous donors. And as well as, um, I'm, I'm talking about large donors, as well as all of those small donations that come in um, through Rally Up and through our HAWA webpage. Uh, so this is really driven by the community that want to see the success of uh, the new recipients. <clears throat> then once the minivans are purchased, 
And that alone is a huge feat. That takes a great deal of searching for someone to go out there and find those vehicles and vet them and bring them back to us. Then what we do is then we have to outfit them. We need to get the materials to put into them, the cots and the five gallon buckets and everything else that goes in them. And that happens by going out on an Amazon wish list. We, the recipients have been contacted. We find out what they have, what they don't have, what they think they'll need, what they don't think they'll need. And from that, we build an Amazon wish list. And that gets put up on um, the Howa Amazon site. And again, the community supports this program and makes it come to fruition. There's, um, you know, Howa doesn't have any money. So this is all community based. And I really, I really want the recipients to understand how many, how much is behind you that to, to that want to see you succeed at what you're doing. Uh, when people are in need of a, of a, a little home on wheels, they see that we've um, announced the application process is open and they make application. And it, it's not an easy application. It's a little bit invasive because we need to be able to respect the donor's wishes. We need to make sure that we're selecting an applicant that will have enough resources to succeed, but not so many, so many resources that they could go out and do this themselves. So we have to find that perfect niche where we um, make a, a selection from the, the pool of applicants. Um, so as we did this, we started realizing there were things that the, the recipients should know because they were asking questions all the time. And so we said, you know, why don't we be proactive and provide this information up front? So we started this list of topics and, uh, and, and it's a living document. This changes, it, it changes during the minivan event, it, much, less, uh, much less just Mm, just at between minivan events. And so <clears throat> this, this list that we're gonna just review on uh, high level today is something that um, will be posted on the YouTube description. So this video, after we're done uh, having this webinar today, will end up on the Hawa YouTube channel and underneath in the description, there will be a link to this document. For all of those that have been asking for this, rather than me emailing, emailing them out to you individually, you can all just go there, click on the link and you've got it for yourself. All right, um, so let's, um, speaking of YouTube, we use YouTube a lot in these. You'll see that there's a, a lot of hyperlinks on this document. When you get, get the digital copy of it, you should be able to click on those. So there should be active links that you can click on and go right to YouTube. And uh, you know, you've all heard it called YouTube University and for good reason, because it's got so much information out there that's shared. And the nice thing about it is you can get it from the different perspective of different YouTube uh, presenters. You know, somebody you might not like the tone of their voice or you don't like their speech patterns. And so you, you don't watch that one, then you find another one and you'll find somebody that clicks and gives it to you at the level and in the way you want to hear it. So under uh, each of these topics, you might find three, maybe four uh, YouTube channels that you could be looking at. And it's not always necessary you watch all of them. You're welcome to, of course, but it's really that you have a choice. And that is one of the things you need to understand too about this document is that there's so much information here. There's so much duplication. There's how many ways can you poop in a bucket? Well, there's a lot. And do you need to use them all? No, you don't. You just need to know that you've got all those choices and then you choose the choice that works for you the best. Um, the other part of this, unfortunately, that's not in this document that It's a shame, but I don't. We haven't figured out how to how to capture it and put it put it down uh, into it. And that is the knowledge that each of the mentors brings, because so much of the knowledge that's gained by the new recipients is gained by camping here. And if we're lucky enough to be able to have a campfire, all the stuff they learn sitting around the campfire, all the stuff they sit when they sit with their mentor and have coffee in the morning, and and the the tidbits that feed into. Um, give the knowledge base. And unfortunately, that's not in this document. But uh, when our, we're able to have our physical caravan start up again, that's where you're going to be able to tap into that knowledge because you'll be able to share it with all the other caravan uh, nomads that are, that are there camping with you. So let's start. All right. 
So for the people that are here, I'm um, going to show you, we have our first page and the first page is about vehicle operation. And this is really specific to obviously to the vehicles that the mentees get. The, the mentees get because they might be a Honda Odyssey, they might be a Toyota Sienna, they might be a, a, a Dodge Grand Caravan or a Town and Country. So they each have different ways of operating. You have different ways of being able to, where, where are the lights, where, how does the air conditioner work, where's the spare tire, all of those good things. So um, that first page is all about how operating your vehicle. Uh, how, where are the lights? Uh, how do you check the fluids? How often do you have to check the fluids? Uh, how do you run the heater and the air conditioner, the defroster? Uh, how do you handle your tires? How do you make sure your tires are in good order? How do you determine how old your tires are? Um, how do you change a tire? Where's your spare? All of the things, tire maintenance is pretty major because we're running on it and they'll, you know, besides gas and brakes, the tires are the next thing that you're, you know, that's right up there with being sure you're safe while you're out there on the road. Um, how to check just even the air pressure, right? <clears throat> they touch on snow, snow chains, but um, we're not actually having anybody try putting on snow chains. <laughs> How to use an air compressor. The recipients receive a, an air pressure gauge and an air compressor, uh, portable air compressor for their tires. So how do you use it? How can you make sure that your tires are in good order, have the right pressure in them, and when do you need to pull out that compressor? Operation of the cruise control, if you've got it, the stereo system, if it's got a sunroof, all of those things, the emergency brake, and keeping records. So um, just having a notebook and a place to put receipts for the vehicle. So you've got all of that in one place, a very, very um, helpful bit of knowledge that all of us think about doing, but the recipients have the opportunity to start out fresh and begin it now, begin those good habits now. The second page, <clears throat> camping. Oh man, this is a huge topic. This even runs more than one page. It's, um, we talk about the, categories of locations like stealth and boondocking and traveling. Those are all different kinds of, of, uh, of camping and they require different skill sets. What you do in the Walmart parking lot is different than what you do when you're camping out here. How you handle your trash, how you handle your waste, how you cover your windows, all of that's different. Mm. How you, what do you do at a truck stop? Where, you know, all of those, the very different kind of camping. Mm, then we need to know as newbies, you don't know how to find a campsite. Now, when I started out, I was fortunate. I, I started out with how, uh, and I was kind of told where to go. And so I didn't have to figure out how to find my first campsite. Um, actually, I did. I, I went to a state park, but that wasn't boondocking, which is what I wanted to do. But the mentees will learn how to, how to find a location. Um, how to find use social media to connect with other other nomads how to how to find out where people are camping how to uh, invite other people to where you are uh, how to use some of the websites if you want to know where to find public um public land camping uh, there's there's um blm land and there's national forest well, how do you find that land and then how to even use paper maps because everything i've talked about so far is digital everything i've talked about so far is getting out your gps on your google maps and and uh, doing searches or going to websites and clicking on links but paper maps are important too because they're not always um, we're not always where there's signal um, and then some of us are just more old school and we like the feel of a map in our hands so that works too Mm, then there's membership camping. Some people were diehard thousand, uh, thousand trails people, or they um, uh, there's harvest host camping where you, you, you actually pay to be a member so they can tell you where you can go stay and, and, uh, and have places that you, you uh, will appeal to your taste for one reason or another. Like the harvest hosts are generally uh, wineries and you can go there and they'll let you stay as long as you're self-contained. And then of course, you're always encouraged to go in and support their business as well. There's escapees, which is another very large um, RV group that uh, has a very active uh, membership. What, um, meet, what HAWA has is Meetup. And through Meetup, we have an organ, uh, a group called Caravans. And by joining Meetup, which has no fee involved, you can go to our Caravans group 
and find our virtual connections, which allows you to meet other camp, other nomads, other people that want to be nomads, and find out where they are and, and develop network and connections that way to find people to camp with. And then there's always friends and family's driveways, which uh, has been affectionately called mooch docking. All right, um, let's see. Another good uh, part to know about is um, knowing how to just do GPS coordinates. Now, I know one of our recipients uh, in this particular group um, has been doing this a long time and really knows what he's doing. And he's done it old school. But for today, we use so, I mean, we rely so heavily on GPS coordinates, which means we need to have a smartphone. And we need to be able to use Google Maps. And so, for instance, when we came to this campsite, I can't tell you how many times I had to send out the GPS coordinate to people to say, this is where we are. And they got on Google Maps and they, they were able to find us without me having to say, go 100 yards this direction, go that way, blah, 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 uh, look for this kind of a rig. And they were able to just come based on the, the GPS coordinates. Um, technology has really changed the way the nomad can, can get around. It's accelerated our ability to network and find locations. <clears throat> Let's talk about the next major category, which is taking care of yourself. And um, this covers a really broad range of huge scope. I mean, it's cover, it covers everything from finding and getting supplies to disposing of your trash to know where to find food and water. So my main varies of camping has have, uh, been Quartzsite, Arizona. They have water kiosks out that you just go up and drop your quarters in and fill up and they're outside. You just pull right up with your rig, really convenient. And then you go up to Oregon and they're not set like that. So that means if I want water, I need to go to the rodeo campgrounds and get water from their spigot. Or I need to go into Walmart with my jugs. I've got to carry, put them all in a basket, go into the kiosk, fill them up, and then carry them all back out and load them on my rig. So, but you don't know that unless you've, um, someone's talked to you about it, right? All right. Um, also, um, where to dispose of trash? How do you dispose of trash responsibly? Uh, what do you do when you get to a, a campground that's trashy? You know, do you, do you have any responsibility in that? Can you do anything to uh, in affect how it is for the next person? Personal hygiene, oh, major topic. That's when, you know, we hardly ever have a gathering without someone having to bring up the subject of poop. And it's just the nomad way. So um, obviously we have to have a major category on our, our topics here about how to take care of personal hygiene, not just staying clean and where do you shower and how do you conserve water while you're out here? Can you live without showering? Um, what's the best baby wipe? You know, on and on and on um, to, knowing how to dispose of your urine properly and responsibly, whether you're in the desert, whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or you're up in the mountains somewhere, because each environment's a little bit different. Um, sustainable kitchen practices. All right, I've spent years and years and years in the kitchen cooking. I've had three kids, I've uh, got grandkids, I've done my share of cooking. I don't really cook anymore, I warm stuff up. Uh, I was talking to a woman yesterday that she, her family encourages her, she travels solo, but her family cur encourages her to go uh, into town every day, every three days at least and get a meal because they know she's not cooking, <laughs> which is amazing. But I, I took a peek in her rig yesterday and it, it has its advantages. If that's the kind of camper you want to be, she doesn't have to worry about food storage. She doesn't have to worry about refrigeration. She doesn't have to worry about cooking utensils or plates or any of that stuff. Instead, you know, she snacks for a couple of days and then every few days she goes in and gets a major meal. So uh, she might have leftovers that she keeps, but uh, you know, very different because I, I have a, a kitchen, a, a small kitchen, granted it's all totally downsized, but I have a kitchen um, and a lot of people do. It's a common way to do it. Um, so how do you do that? How do you do your dishes? Um, there are so many different ways that people do their dishes. Some people don't do dishes at all. They prefer to have disposable items. So it depends on your ethics. It depends on your, um, what you, how, how it fits for your lifestyle. 
in your in your eating style. We talk about clothing. We talk about clothing. How you know? We we only have a limited amount of space. We can't have you know a walk-in closet and then use the second bedroom's closet as well for our our clothing. We just some people carry a lot of clothes, but we cannot carry that much. So you know what? How do you make it work? How do you make it work? And what is it you need to have um, with you? So we talk about the options there. Then we talk about screens and window covering because that changes what kind of camping you're doing as well. And how do you put screens on? What are you, what kind of window coverings do you want to use? What do you do if you're camping in warm weather, or cold weather? How do you keep the sun out? All of the things that involve window coverings. Then we talk about animals in the desert and other hazards, all right? Uh, you will see that's fairly well developed section because uh, the person that was helping me come up with YouTube channels really wanted to know about the hazards in the deserts, um, not just the animals, but also the cactus and also the heat, um, the wind, the what happens to the desert when it rains? What about the washes? Um, you know, I don't know about you. I grew up in Wisconsin and I had no concept of a dry riverbed or a wash and was shocked when I watched my first couple of videos about what happens to a wash in the rain and, and how it comes down and it's so deadly. And since I've been involved in how we've had phone calls from people that have lost everything because they camped in a wash and they got stuck. And then, and then the big water came and took away everything and then never, they'll never recover it, it's gone. So um, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't been able to be around other people that could teach me that. Uh, coyotes, don't feed the wildlife. Wow, I've got stories about that. Um, <clears throat> and nomad safety, you know, are you going to carry weapons? What do you do to protect yourself if you're, if you're in town, if you're out of town? Um, can you, you know, it, is it, what's the, the real risk out here anyway? Um, I, I have to, I just have to put my own two cents in here because I feel so much safer boondocking. Uh, I feel so much uh, safer when I'm not being noticed and I'm camping alone. Um, if I have to camp in town or near town, I don't ever camp in town, but if I ever have to camp near town, I feel I start getting really antsy because all these people are driving by and they see me here and they might not want me here or they, they're just got, they're grumpy that day and they're gonna give me trouble. I've not ever had that, but I, um, I, I just makes me uneasy. Uh, I'd much rather stay at a truck stop or a Walmart. I feel much better there. So, and from my perspective, safety on the road is, um, I've just, I've really had no issues at all. Um, but uh, with that being said, I've carried bear spray. I have, <clears throat> I have things at hand that could be used as a weapon. Um, and some people, and then there's a whole discussion about firearms, and we're not going to go into that today, but that's another part of safety. Uh, Carolyn's RV, uh, no, not Carolyn's RV, a Creativity RV, Robin from Creativity RV did an amazing video on safety. She talked about all kinds of electronics that you can use for giving you fair warnings, even if it's just a motion detect uh, detector light outside your rig. Uh, she really got into it and was putting up. Um, at a distance, you know, these driveway alarms. So if somebody came up close to it, she would be alerted that someone was coming close to her rig. Um, so that that is one of the resources in here too. It's a great video for those that are interested in that. Weather apps, you know, part of being safe is knowing what the weather is. <clears throat> so one of the things that uh, particularly in the last month that I've noticed is um, I know in the next four days, we're gonna have over 80 degree weather. We're gonna have weather here that's gonna be, um, in the high 80s. For me, that's cooking. I That's just really hot. And I have a dog. That's too hot. I'm not going shopping. I'm not going to town and leaving him in a car when I know the weather's going to be like that. Um, the other thing that we've run into is wind. So even moving up from Quartzsite to where we are now, I was pulling a cargo trailer. I delayed my trip a day because I knew by looking at my weather app, the wind was going to be prohibitive. And I didn't want to be pulling in that. So we put it off. We just adjusted our schedule based on the weather. So weather apps are really important and there's an, any number of them out there. It's good to experiment and see which one you work best with. Excuse me, Phyllis. I'm giving you your five minute warning here and Willie will open the chat 
for your questions. So please ask your questions for Phyllis and all of our mentors here. And we will open the chat right now. Go ahead. Wow, I can't believe this. This is perfect because I, I only have really one more thing to talk about, and that is um, mental health on the road, especially during COVID. That's been um, that's been a challenge for all of us. We all miss our hugs. We miss um, being able to sit closer, being able to see smiles, be able to read people's faces um, because of uh, you know the coverings we have to wear. So there, there's help out here. Um, couple of different ones I want to mention just briefly, and that is uh, th there's um, a nomadchapter.org, and it is um, it offers peer-to-peer -peer help where they have meetings multiple times a week. You can call in on those, and I think there's Zoom meetings as well. And it's just people that are struggling with some of the same things that you might be struggling with. And you've got people that are uh, there with a good ear and um, and support for you and maybe suggestions on how to deal with or how they're you can learn how they're going through what they're going through and how they're managing it um so that's a really important resource for us out here another one i'd like to suggest um it's not on here i need to put it on here is something called better help and for those of you that um, need one-on-one -on -one counseling from a professional that's a, a virtual uh counseling group that um, is very affordable and uh, you go through a little bit of a questionnaire and they match you up with a, a counselor. And if that one doesn't work, they'll set you up with someone else. Um, very, uh, very handy on the road kind of counseling for those that choose to take part in that. And then, and then there's the mental health we get from our friends and community. And that's what I wanna end my, my uh, presentation with today is the importance of the community. I started with talking about community, how this wouldn't happen. We wouldn't be here without the community. And the best way to stay connected with the community is to get involved. And that is one of the greatest things how it does is we have events that volunteers and hopefully we'll have more in-person events so we can have more volunteer activity. But, um, one of the easiest ways to get involved is become a volunteer. Whether it's with us or even volunteering with community activities. So if, go volunteer at the food bank, go volunteer with uh, things that are going on in the town too, that you're staying nearby. Um, and then once we get our physical caravans back up and running, um, that's another way to start developing friendships and, and, and networks. One of the things Hawa feels strongly about is that when people come together in the caravans and they make strong connections with people and they want to spin off and start their own caravan, that is the greatest success because that's a sure sign the community's growing. With that, I'm all set. Excellent. That was fantastic, Phyllis. Hopefully that's all good information for the, uh, our, especially a lot of our new people that are coming out onto the road because uh, we do encourage you to download this link when we get it up on the YouTube page so you can have this information right there in front of you. Rob, I think Suanne's giving us the thumbs up that she has posted it on the Facebook business page. So if you go, if you go to on the Homes, Homes on, on Wheels Alliance. Yes. Homes on Wheels Alliance. Oh, on our website. On our website. Thank on you. On our website, we have this document linked. So you can go there, click on it. See what we're talking about? Upper right hand corner. Upper right hand corner. Thank you, Sue Ann. Thank you very much. Now we'll get to some of our questions that we have here. That was really wonderful. I think this is an excellent program. I can't tell you how much when I started joining a caravan really settled me in and helped me. Yes. So we have a question from Lisa B here. She says, thank you, Phyllis, for doing all that you do. How can I become a mentor? <laughs> We'll put you on our list, Lisa B. And you know, that's a really good point though. Let's tell you a little bit about what we look for in a mentor. We look for somebody who is absolutely a full-time nomad, at least a year's experience so that you've experienced all the seasons. Um, because we are putting people into minivans, it's better that you have small living experience. If you've been a, a 
person who's been in a large class A, you might have a little bit more difficulty relating to somebody moving into a minivan. Doesn't mean you don't have valuable experience, but um, it is definitely a different animal, I think. Uh, so being a full-time nomad, at least a year on the road, um, empathetic, uh, oh, and willing to stay put for two weeks. That's a huge thing on a, on a, a nomad to ask them to do that. We're eternally grateful for people that are willing to put roots down for that amount of time. Um, I think that's all I've got on that. Okay. Very good. Let's see here. What do we have next? We have John says, and I'm sorry, it's a little troubling for me to read this in the sun. What was the resource website of talking to other nomads about our struggles? You mentioned that they have Zoom meetings. Right. You'll find that on the last page of the topic. So if you go to the HOWA website, you will, um, well, not the last page. It's on the, where did it go? Ah, okay. <laughs> it is actually um, on the third page, fourth page. And it is uh, deep. I'm going to, um, how can we best get that out to you? Once I get on the chat after the 10 o'clock hour, I will, I can put it in the chat for you. So why don't you watch there? Uh, it's a, it's a, apparently a very useful tool. I haven't ch stopped in on any of those. By the by, in all of my excitement, I did pass over one very important category that we do cover, and that is life skills. That includes phone and internet on the road, nomad etiquette, because what we do out on the road is different than what we do in sticks and bricks. Uh, finding other nomads, which I covered a bit, budgeting. One of the things that we find um, is that a lot of us have been able to get through life without budgeting. We've got a good feel for how much money comes in. We've got a feel for what money goes out, but we don't ever quantify it. We don't ever figure out what our priorities are and what we really want to spend our money on. So there's a fair amount of the uh, mentoring that goes into specifically into budgeting. And, um, you know, obviously we can talk to people about it and whether they choose to go forward with it is their own business, but it's important that they've at least had that chance to hear how it can work for them and how it can empower them in making their choices going forward. Um, working on the road, getting seasonal jobs, that's an important topic and it's one thing that gets covered here. Um, how to find a mechanic, how to, how to find a state to domicile in, how do you handle pets and their safety on the road. <laughs> and then the eternal acronyms. What's the what's BLM? What's RTR? What, what's a WRTR? What's an LTVA? And so forth. Those are all very confusing terms that get thrown around liberally in our conversation. So um, it's one more thing that's uh, covered. So uh, thank you. I'm glad I, I found that extra page that I looked over before. Yep. And we, we managed to post that link into the chat. So you should have it. Oh, thank you. A couple of our great um attendees wonderful have posted that as well uh we have a question here it's the same question which do you feel is a better method to travel cargo vans minivans or cargo trailer i've been having difficulty finding any of these options uh yeah well finding what you you know want to live in is is a huge topic and it's a topic on its own uh, it really depends who you are, depends on what your comfort levels or re requirements are. Um, minivans are, uh, some people do, uh, handle minivans for years. It's a different kind of camping and, and boondocking. I really love my cargo van with a high top. It fits me well and I, um, I, I feel totally bonded. It's my fort. I did it myself. It's rustic um, and I feel like... Uh, like, like I'm 12 years old when I go in there. <laughs> then I've, I've created my little fort in the woods. Um, but other people want more more comforts. And so you're, that's, that's a very, very personal decision you have to make. But then once you make that decision, finding it is another thing. You know, you can probably find cargo trailers very easily, but then you have to have something to pull it with. Uh, minivans are getting a little harder to find uh, for uh, an economical price. Uh, and as our full-size bands. So start saving your money. 
all the way around. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough choice. That was probably the hardest choice I had to make between the two. Uh, Susan Shaver says, what brand and type of air compressor do you provide to the newbies? Ah, oh, good question. I don't know um, the name brand. Uh, Sue Ann's going to look that up for us real quick. Um, and there, there are any number of them out there. The one you, you do need to pay attention to what kind of vehicle you've got, so you know the tire pressure it requires, because they are based on um, how, how much pressure it has to pump into that tire. So if it's um, a small one, you've got a little, you know, a Honda Fit or something, you you can get a small one, and it, you look at how much the tire pressure is, you look at what it says on the box about what that compressor will do, then you choose the one that's appropriate for that. Mine ran about $70, $60, $70, I think. Um, but mine goes up to, I think, 150 pounds of pressure. Rob's shaking his head. Yeah, what's yeah, your experience, I think that's, mine's the same way. I have, I think, the Velar, it was about $70 or $75, and it goes to like 180 I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it just hooks up, you just hook it up to the battery, 12 volt power. Take it down to your tire and fill yep. your ears. And one of the things I just used it mine about a month and a half ago, and it was really slick because I had for the first time had to use it on my rear tires. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Because here's this little compressor, the the wires on it are you know are just going to get to my battery. Now how am I going to how am I going to do? Well, it, the hose is a long coil hose, and it reached from my hood on my cargo van to my rear tires. And the real slick part of it is that the valve will screw onto the tire valve. So now it's hands-free, right? Now I can go back to the front, turn it on, watch the gauge as it, as it pumps up. So I get to the right amount, then I can turn it off. Now I can go and I can unscrew it and it's done. It, I really was, um, that was quite a clever, clever way of making it work. Excellent, very good. Art asks, how can I win a minivan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite questions because um, it's not about winning a min minivan. Um, this is really about, we're, you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization. And yes, we do have sweepstakes for fundraising purposes, but this is a program. The minivan award program is not a sweepstakes. It's a it's an award uh, that comes through the support of our donors, and we have really strict rules we've got to follow. Um, but but I will, what I will tell you, which might help you, because I think the underlying question that you're really asking is what do we look for in the recipient? And so let me go through a little list that Sue Ann wrote up the other day that I think is really succinct and might help people that are thinking about applying. The client is, is in need of a safe and secure shelter. They cannot afford a minivan home on wheels on their own. You need to think about that. That means what are your assets? Are you able to, would you be able to go out and buy it and still have a little bit of reserve for your, your emergency? fund. Can you afford regular maintenance? Because if you get a minivan, we don't want to set you up to fail. You go driving off with this minivan as an awardee, and but you can't even afford to keep doing regular oil changes. Um, we don't want to set you up for that kind of failure because the, the vehicle is just going to get run into the ground in that way. So you have to be able to afford regular maintenance. You have to be able to afford a monthly emergency savings. We do what's called an escrow account for you. So each each re, uh, recipient sits down and discusses uh, their budget, and that's why budgeting is so important. And then there's an awareness that's given about how much money could be put into an escrow account each month. And that money then is, it's a commitment that that person, that recipient makes, that they will pay into that escrow account every month that amount of money. At the end of three years, when the contract is finished, they get that money back. So now they've got a nest egg. And it's also with our, our hopes is that it develops a savings habit that I've been able to do that every month. And gosh, I can continue to do that every month. And you can continue to have a, a safety net for yourself. So that escrow account is a really important. Um, you, you, there has to be enough 
um, wiggle room in the budget to be able to afford to be able to save something. All right. Um, for, you know, just as it is difficult for our nomads to come and decide to spend two weeks with us as nomads out here, as mentors out here, the recipients have to be willing to be able to get to um, where we're doing the no build build and spend two weeks with us. And that's an important part of the program as well. Um, the client needs to collaborate in furnishing their minivan home on wheels. So that means that they not only um, talk with us about what they have, what they need, and what they want, so that we can come up with the Amazon wish list, but we don't do this for you. This is something you do, you do with us. You're the ones that say, you know, I'd like to do it this way. You know, these are, these are the supplies we have. How is it going to be organized? And the mentor doesn't put it in the rig. The recipient puts it in the rig. The recipient knows how it all fits together because they're active participants in what we're doing. And that's extremely important because one of the main qualities that you need as a, as a nomad coming out here is self-reliance. Yes, we're all interconnected as a community, but if all of us only only depended on others to do things for us, we'd, we'd just we'd collapse. So self-reliance is an extremely important quality of a nomad. Um, you must, uh, we, the client must remain an active nomad living out of the uh, warded minivan. So this isn't meant to be a, a vehicle for you to go back to sticks and bricks and carry on your life. This is a, a, a home on wheels and you're meant to be staying in it for those three years. You agree to a three-year commitment. And if that doesn't, so that, that is something that needs to be thought of up front. You need to consider that, yes, I am willing to be out here and be a nomad for three years. Some people who uh, have a little more resources say, well, I'm going to try it for a year and see if it works. And then if I don't, I always know I, I, I've got a fallback. And that's great. But in our case with the recipients, we're asking for a three-year commitment to stay on the road. Um, I've already talked about the escrow. And um, there's open communication between the recipient and HAWA for that three-year period of time. Uh, also, one of the things that I didn't see on here is insurance, that you're, you will keep the vehicle insured during that time. So I hope that helps the question okay. about yeah. what it is that it takes to- uh, so We're not uh, winning the minivan. You're not <laughs> winning the minivan. Yep, that does. Uh, it is important because it is about being independent. I mean, this is the same life as if you lived in sticks and bricks. It's just a different location. Right. So, so when, the, when the applications come in and they get reviewed, they get reviewed with the eye to who would have the best chance of being successful at this. Right. Excellent. Very good. Paul asks, I don't use the Internet. How can I learn these things? Oh, man. You know, that's it's a hard one. Um, uh, how it came into being during the internet age. Uh, it's, we're, we're just here. We're part of the digital world. Um, I, I think about it sometimes. How, how did nomads do it in the 90s? You know, how did they do it back in the 80s? My brother used to come out of Minnesota every winter and with a motorcycle and travel Arizona. And he just, it was, a, I, there's got to be a different, a different soul, piece of the soul that allows you to really go out there and explore, be willing to get lost, be willing to, to deal with whatever comes up and meets you. As current day nomads, with the use of the internet, we can have so much of that known ahead of time. We can know where our friends are gonna be camping. We can, we can find out what the weather's gonna be. We can find uh, so much that we can, that makes our lives easier and to just be connected with one another. Um, I, I, um, you can do it. You can do it without the internet. And, um, but it's, I have to say, I'm too much of a newbie to tell you how you can do it. I know that there's paper maps. And I think that one of the other key elements is that you've got that part in your soul that you're willing to be a true explorer, that you're willing to face what the road brings to you, what the weather brings to you and consider it an adventure and a blessing. Um, it's a different kind of a, of a mindset. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. We get so oriented to using these mechanical things, but these paper maps, and you just go find a camping area and explore. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of the fun of it. Grace asks, you talk a lot about the desert. What about the mountains in the East Coast? Oh, man. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because that is, um, it's true. Almost everything on here has to do with, with the Southwest. Um, I, no talk about bears. No talk about severe rain that's, you know, that's day after day after day after rain. No talk about snow camping. None of that. So I'm going to encourage you that if you know about those things and you'd like to add that to our list, please uh, write in. And if uh, someone can put into our chat to that, I would like you to write into homes on wheels alliance at gmail.com and put in it uh, the subject line uh, mentoring topics. I would love to get that. I would like you to give us links. I'd like you to give us um, uh, ideas about the East Coast and and other air, other e environments that haven't been included on this particular document. That'd be great. Thank you. Very good. We got that in there. Yeah, that's what Tim asked. He goes, I would like to add ideas to this list. Oh, so perfect. <laughs> perfect, Tim. He, he wants to know how to share them. We just posted it in the chat. It's Homes on Wheels Alliance <laughs> at gmail.com. And the subject line was mentoring? Uh, mentoring topics. Mentoring yep. topics. Yep. So send your ideas, and we will be happy to add them to our lists. Um, just real quick, as uh, the people that are here, do you have any questions? If you do, please feel free to jump in. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if it's, if something comes up, let us know. Okay. That's what we're here for. We answer a lot of questions all the time. May says, this is awesome. And Barb says, thank you for the presentation. Amen. Scooby asks, when will the physical caravan start up again? Oh, where's my crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I must have left it in the van, sorry. Um, would love to know that too. And it's totally based on the um, pandemic situation. You know, we were had our fingers crossed for the summer. That's not happening. So we have our fingers crossed for the fall. We'll see. Not likely yet. Not like it's not looking good, which puts us down into the winter quarter, like starting in, um, let's say, I think that would be uh, October, November, December. Um, that would, there's, you know, let's, let's, let's all think good thoughts and hope that we can start it up by then. Uh, and then also the RTR, hoping we can do the RTR in a physical presence where we can all camp together again, too. When is the next bill? Oh, the next build. Are you talking about the no build builds? Ah, very good question. We'll be, um, we've been uh, working on them, doing, having them in the spring and in the fall. So the next one's probably be October, November. Again, the shoulder season. So we probably don't be in this particular area again in the fall. Thank you for asking that. Sandy asked, what books or other printed materials do you recommend for? nomads camping well, you know i'm going to go ask um bobby if you would go get do you know where the books are in the trailer there bob bob wells wrote a book about how to live in a vehicle and um, we actually have a couple copies in the trailer uh, that's here and do, do you happen to know where they are? Bobby? I do, yes. Oh, wonderful, great. So as soon as she brings that back, I'll hold it up and you all can see. And it's on Amazon, you can get it. Very inexpensive, something like $6 or whatever. I don't know if it's Kindleized. I don't know if it's been, is it a Kindle version too? Oh, wonderful. So if you go to Amazon, you'd be able to find it there and you can get the hard, uh, the paperback or get it on Kindle. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we'll wait for Bobby to bring that to us and we'll so, Rob, how long have you been on the road? Uh, I've been on the road about a year and a half now. Oh, very good. And so you said something about the caravans being a help to you. Oh, yeah, that was definitely one. My goal as I, you know, as I left Oregon, I built my van in Oregon. And when I left, I traveled down the Oregon coast and saw my old, where I grew up, you know, at Coos Bay. And uh, 
I started traveling into California. And my whole intention was to join the caravans because I knew that this was a great place to get my start and to kind of get my feet. Well, wait a second, and, how did you know about the caravans? Uh, through Bob Wells' videos and okay. off his channel. Okay. I mean, they're pretty well known, you know, he's very famous. So, and that made it a lot easier. And then I joined the meetup groups and uh, started talking to people on the meetup groups. And, so in, in the meetup group, well, that was set up with the, the meetup group was set up originally for the physical caravans. And so that's how you would RSVP saying you were going to be at that location, a caravan. The way that worked is um, Sue Ann went out and scouted areas where people could, could meet and congregate uh, as many as 75 people on public land. And, but in order to try and keep that, that it wouldn't go over that number, we used this, um, uh, social media app called Meetup, and people would just create a little profile for themselves, and they would come to our group, and they would be able to see where the caravans were going to be located. Um, we usually ran anywhere from three to five caravans consecutively, um, concurrently. Pardon me, concurrently, and they could say, "Well, I want to go to that one," and and they could also see who had signed up. So if they were looking for where their friends were going to be, they could say, "Oh, that's where they're going to be." So they would click on that and RSVP. The coordinates were there and they hopefully learned how to use coordinates and they could show up and and be there then for the next two weeks and and camp out and they people didn't have to stay you could you could drop in for a few days and then go try out another one or go do something else or come back later it, it worked out really really well so that's what you were doing you were doing yeah. the physical care yeah i actually remember pulling into i believe it was scad and wash to a caravan but i didn't see anybody so i ended up going well that's all right i wanted to go to cibola wildlife anyway uh -huh. so i went to cibola Wait wildlife a how did you know on, how did you know about cibola because it's uh it was a caravan oh it had been a caravan it okay good a caravan so okay. i went down there and before i could even park my van people were going oh are you here with Hawa?" <laughs> and hey you know we're, we're all parked over here and so I just parked over there and became part of the group. We had campfires every night and it was just so much fun. And that really makes you feel comfortable when you're first starting out and you don't know anybody. It really helped a lot. Yeah. And I stayed with the caravans pretty much all winter long. Did you? Mm -hmm. And it's nice because if you don't know where to go, you start learning locations, you know? And so now you go back there cause you're familiar with it and you'll go back again. Yeah, yeah, it's very handy. Oh yeah, the locations was very key. I, I used a bunch of them this year. <laughs> Actually, that's true. I have two when I've been going between places. I do. Very yeah. Good. yeah, you learn all sorts of good camping spots that way. Uh, David's... Oh, before you start for the next yes. question, this is the book. So it's how, how to live in uh, uh, a car, van, or an RV. Bob wrote this a while back, and uh, it's still full of very useful, very useful. In 2013, he copyrighted it. So um, I encourage you to get a hold of a copy of this and um, and go through it. There's also, um, he does now Skillshare. Yeah, I think so. Skillshare. And Udemy. And Udemy. Those are, um, we'll put the links underneath the, uh, the description when we get this up on YouTube. The thing is that Bob will tell you, yeah, the Udemy and Skillshare, they're classes that you pay for. Uh, and they're very economical. They're well worth it. But he's going to be the first one. And I've heard him say this multiple times. Everything that you get in those paid for classes, he has on his website or he has in his videos. So you don't need to take those classes. But for those that want them in a all in one place and they're all nice and tidy, they're there for you as well. So we will put those links in the description after the uh, this post on YouTube. I do know of another about uh, uh, Be a Nomad, Change Your Life. Oh, be, and who, who wrote that? Robin, Creativity. Oh, uh, yeah, Army. right. Yes, there, there are other really good books out there. I haven't read that one yet, but I do like the way Robin presents. It's Robin, this is Robin from Creativity RV. Um, and if you go to her YouTube channel, I'm sure she'll give you a link to that book. She's she's great and she's got a, she's really a wonderful resource. She does a lot of great research before she posts. Do we have any others? Oh yeah, we have we have a list of questions. Now. Do you have a shop on Amazon for any recommended nomad tools and gear? Uh, you know what you want to do. I I'm Howa currently doesn't have 
that. We do have some things out as affiliates, Suanna, correct? But Bob has so many more. So if you, um, would you help us? How would you recommend somebody do that? Right, so if you go to cheaprvliving.com, you can go to Bob's shop. How is such a new organization that we are not mature enough in Amazon's eyes to have a shop yet? But uh, we will, we'll get there. And when we do, we'll publish that information. Yep. And by supporting Bob, Bob is our number one backer. He's the um, president of- uh, And he's also the president of our board of trustees. So by supporting him, it's going to filter down to us anyway. <laughs> So, and you thanks. can support Howa by going to smile.amazon.com, is it? And putting it in as your donation thing. Howa Homes on Wheels Alliance is now listed as a charity on Amazon. So go to smile.amazon and add the charity of Howa. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Ann. Um, Karen H says, can you share ideas for those who might like informal mentoring, not through its programs? Would it be through CRVL or Meetup or how do you get informal mentoring? You know, a really good place is through the virtual caravan, the virtual connections, because um, there are full-time nomaders there. And I know Car Karen, you are already attending a lot of those meetings. and. Uh, I think you'll agree that the information we uh, gain through those groups uh, is very helpful. And the thing that's nice about it is it's very gentle. You don't even realize you're absorbing all this information. And it just, you know, you kind of get it by hanging out in those uh, Zoom meetings. Um, that's that's the right now, for now, probably one of the best bets you've got. We also, I'm also going to encourage you to go, it's not mentoring, but it's um, go to the Howa YouTube channel because there's several playlists there. There's the WRTR playlist from the classes that were in 2021, as well as uh, the RTR playlist of classes. A really great basic knowledge. And those were put up by other YouTubers. Uh, we invited YouTubers for the most part to come and present those. So they bring um, a, a little different perspective and a little different energy to the classes. They're very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I agree. The virtual connections, we get a lot of, we have a lot of experienced nomads there and they give a lot of great advice. I've learned You've learned a lot. About you. Well, One you suggestion might be too is that if they post in uh, Camp Together on Facebook and get with a, uh, a group with, where their location is and they can just say, I'm a newbie that I'm looking for somebody to camp together in this particular area. You know, Walt, you're bringing up a really good point because one of the um, Facebook groups that Howa does have is Camp Together. And in there, you can post where you're going to be, who, you, what type of people you'd like to camp with. You can find other people and go to their camp if, you, if they're in agreement and you connect, or you can invite people to yours and only let in people that you want to have that have similar views and, and whatnot. Um, and so even though Howa's not having uh, physical caravans now people are camping as as friends together as pods and again another way for you to to be able to get out there and um, experience that so if uh, if you go to if you're we can we'll be putting those links in the description but also if you go to the Howa website there's a social media tab go to the social media tab and all of our Facebook groups are there on our YouTube channels all that kind of stuff so Go ahead and check that out. Excellent. Yep, we are at the end of our time. Do you have any last words or? I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to share this with you and get out the request for people to add to it. As I said, it's a living document and we always appreciate that. Um, and you know, the link is up on the web page, but go back and check it out every so often because the document will change and the, therefore when you hit that link you're going to see an, an improved document each time all right thank you very much all for being here excellent thank you so much phyllis you did a <laughs> wonderful job thank you. phyllis will be coming over and doing into the chat she will answer questions for the next 15 minutes just chat only the video part of the presentation has ended so thank you all for coming and we will see you next time